Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book Two North or Be Eaten. Chapter 64 And the Sea Turned Red. No! Janner screamed. The ruby dragon grunted, reared back, and hesitated. Do it! said the old dragon. But the young dragon's eyes fell on Lily and her twisted leg. It looked at Poto, trembling and bent on his knees. No, said Holwyn, a young, weary voice in Janner's mind. What? said the old one. Let them go, said Holwyn. His scars run deeper than mine. Then she sank beneath the waves. The old gray beast's fury shook the air. Its flanks rippled like a flag in a windstorm. The dragon's wordless cry stabbed Janner's mind, and he clamped his eyes shut and pressed both hands against his forehead. The other dragons shared the old one's rage until the water around the ship foamed like Fingap Falls. Artham launched himself into the air and waved his sword at the great beast as it descended. With a flick of its nose, the dragon threw Artham against the glacier so hard the hunks of ice crashed into the sea. Artham was stunned, but his wings beat the air as he fell. The tips of his toes touched the water as he swooped up and circled the dragon again. Janner no longer heard words in his mind. The creature had gone wild. He knew that if Artham hadn't distracted it, the dragon would have splintered the ship already and they would be dead. Janner, Lily said. Get the first book. Hurry. Why? I don't know where it is. Ask Earl. Gammon said our things are on the ship. Go. Janner had no idea what Lily had in mind, but he was glad to do something other than wait to be eaten. He took the steps down from the forecastle in one leap. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Oscar still flailing about on his back, unable to find his feet on the rocking boat. Earl and the rest of the crew had subdued the gray fangs and held them against the ship's rail at sword point. Earl, where are our packs? Janner cried. In the captain's quarters, through that door. Janner burst into the room and saw his pack in a pile of bedrolls and furs beside a large desk. He rummaged through it and yanked out the old book, wondering what Lily planned to do. When he emerged from the cabin, he saw the great dragon wheeling about, snapping its teeth at Artham as he flew around its head like a gnat. The sound of the dragon's jaws closing on empty air was like lightning splintering an oak in two. Janner wondered why Poto and the others hadn't sought cover, but he knew as well as they did that it was futile. If the dragon wanted Poto, the dragon would have him. Even if the old man hid in the ship's hold, the creature would have little trouble crushing the ship with one bite. Janner bounded up the steps and skidded to a halt in front of Lily. She frantically flipped through the pages, thrust the book at Janner, and said, Hold it open one where I can see it. Janner looked at the page, but saw nothing but odd letters and lines. Lily reached inside her coat and removed the whistle harp. Light reflected from it and glinted on the dragon's face. The dragon stilled. Lily raised the whistle harp to her lips with trembling hands and studied the markings on the ancient paper. A great silence seemed to descend on the world. The Chimerans, Artham, and even the Grey Fangs waited to see what would happen. Then the melody broke on them like a sunrise. After the first few notes, the dragon drew in a slow, deep breath and closed its eyes. Lily's song grew in strength and tension and beauty, and as she reached the first refrain, the sea dragon exhaled a warm, mountainous note. Its voice was round and rich and somehow fragrant, like the song of a tree might sing when it's blossoms in springtime. Jurgen's tune! said Oscar, who stopped struggling and lay back on the deck with a big smile on his face. Good last, Lily. The dragon raised its face to the sky with careful grace until his gleaming scales caught the sun and the beast towered above them like a giant golden scepter. Soon the other dragons joined it in song, and Janner felt that his heart might burst. He heard the clatter of swords as they slipped from the Chimerian's limp hands while the big men stood in awe. Artham spread his arms and wings wide and basked in the song as if it were sunlight. Poto knelt behind Lily as still as a statue, unwilling or unable to raise his eyes to her or to the dragons. 
On his face was a look of insufferable shame, both for the killing of young dragons and for the way his treachery had nearly killed those whom he loved. Lily lowered the whistle harp when she had played all she could of Jurgen's tune, but the dragons continued. Grandpa, Lily said gently. Poto lifted his eyes as if they weighed a thousand pounds. Get up, she said. She took his old, crooked hand and her tiny, elegant one and raised him. Janner believed no other force in all of air we are. Not the finest words nor the strongest grip would have been enough to lift the broken old pirate. Only Lily's voice and tender hand. The gray fangs covered their ears. They howled with pain, but the sound was faint and distant and had no power to disrupt the dragon's music. Tink squirmed in Naya's arms. His eyes remained closed, but his claws dug into her skin and drew blood. She held him tighter and kissed his fur. Get these beasts below deck, said Earl, and see to the wounded. He and his men bound the arms of the six remaining fangs. The creatures, groggy and disoriented, were led to the ship's hold without protest. The dead fangs had already turned to dust. Clumps of fur collected in the corners and lifted away on the breeze. Janner hoped that when the song ended, the dragons would sink away as he had seen them do so many times before. But they did not. Instead, the old gray one arched its neck and looked down on them with a fierce stillness. At last, said the dragon, comes one who can ease our sorrow with song. We thought we would never again hear this music. How, little one, did you come to learn this melody? You sang something like it when the half moon rose, but it has been long since we have heard it as it was written. Footnote 1. See Book 1, page 53, where Lily sings with the sea dragons. She learned it from this book, Janner said. It's one of the first books. The first books, the dragon said. They have been lost for epochs. And yet, said Artham, the song maiden has just played Jurgen's tune. How else could she have learned it? Janner sensed the dragon remembering things from long ago, things the sea dragon had forgotten they ever knew as if Lily's whistle harp were a key that had unlocked a secret chamber in the dragon's mind. He saw the ages turn like pages in a picture book. The old gray dragon glided backward through the waters of time with fins like wings, appeared younger by a day every hundred years, and led its herd a thousand times from Fingap Falls to the deep caverns of the sunken mountains, where stones gave light and the walls swirled with pictures. He saw the dragons in pursuit of pirate ships, young dragons roped and hauled to the decks. He saw that in the days of the pirates, young dragons traveled the waters alone and were vulnerable. Only when they banded together as a herd did the pirates fear them and the hunting cease. Then Janner sensed the dragons swimming back to an older time, when the world itself felt younger, when the sun was brighter and the waters warm. The old dragon saw itself wrecking ships battering helpless sailors and their families. It remembered worming its way into the shore to flatten villages and scar the land while the people wailed. Terror was in their eyes, and the dragon knew its own deeds were once dark. It pushed further into memory, but was met with a gray nothingness. No explanation for its fury, no cause for the killing. It would take another song to open those chambers. Janner felt a new emotion arise in the dragon's mind. Contrition. The dragon had done evils of its own and regretted them. Polwyn, the ruby dragon, raised her disfigured head from the water. The gray dragon closed its eyes and nuzzled her. Janner could tell they spoke with each other, but they had closed him off. He could hear nothing of what they said and wondered if the same were true of Artham. When the dragons finished, Holwyn looked into Janner's eyes and nodded. A final passage, she said, and she sank away again. Janner and Artham looked at each other with surprise. There is no evil in justice, said the gray dragon. The old man himself knows this. Though Jurgen's tune has awakened pity in my ancient heart, the blood of our children cries out for justice. 
we will allow him the mercy of one last passage across the sea. Scale Raker may live out his last days in peace. But should he ever enter the waters again, the dragon said, his days on air we are will end. Without anger, without warning, we will rise from the deep and swallow him. So shall our dead be honored. Do you understand? Janner and Artham nodded gravely. Yes, lords, said Artham. We thank you. They're letting him pass. Janna ran to Poto and hugged him around the waist. Grandpa, they're letting you go. Eh? The look on Poto's face alternated between disbelief and joy, which caused his bushy eyebrows to raise and fall like foamy waves. Naya raised her head to the heavens and mouthed a prayer while Lily squealed and hopped onto Poto's thick arms. When the laughter and happy tears subsided, the dragons were gone. The ship rocked on the waves with the cliffs of the ice prairies behind and the wide horizon ahead. Then a voice spoke that killed the smile on every face. Put me down, it said. It was an odd voice, raspy and deep as it was young. Tink was awake, and he was growling. He snapped at Naya and scratched her arms. She cried out and let him go, and the little thing scurried away as soon as his paws hit the deck. He squatted in a corner and panted like a dog. His eyes darted from his family to the crew of the ship to the sea spray that splashed onto the deck, and it was his eyes that sent a shiver down Janner's spine. His brother was no taller than before, and even with the wolfish features, he still somehow looked like Tink. But his eyes were yellow and wild. There was no depth or recognition there, just a flat, shallow emptiness Janner had seen before. He had seen it when Slarb glared at him in the cell of the Glipwood Jail. He had seen it when Commander Norm waggled his bejeweled fingers at him. He had seen it in the eyes of Timber, the leader of the Grey Fangs. This creature might look like Tink, but it was no longer Tink. It was a fang, through and through. Son, Naya said, her voice thick with sorrow. Streaks of blood colored her skin where he had scratched her. It's me. It's your mama. Tink growled. She took a step near, but the wolf boy swiped a paw in the air and curled his lip. Don't come any closer, he said. Where am I? He looked around, desperate to escape. He turned and peeked over the railing at the waves as if he might jump overboard, and Janner noticed for the first time that his brother had a tail. Janner's stomach tightened, and he feared he might vomit or weep. He didn't know which. Don't scare him, Lily said in the voice she used when she'd set her affection on an animal. It's all right. We don't want to hurt you. The wolf ignored her and paced the railing, anxious for a place to run. What's your name? asked Artham. At this, Tink grew still. He cocked his head sideways like a dog. I don't know. I don't know my name. Shall I tell you? Artham said carefully. You might not like it. Tink studied the reddish man with wings. He shifted on his feet, licked his chops, and whined. Tell me, he said in a small voice. Your true name is Kalmar Wingfeather. The wolf boy's ears flattened against his head, and he howled at the sky. He flew into a fit of rage and darted about the deck. He snapped and clawed at his family. Naya and Lily screamed. Janner and Poto put themselves between the women and the wild animal as Artham struggled to subdue him. Every time he laid a hand on the wolf, its teeth sank into his skin. The Chimerans took up arms and raced to the prow at the commotion. Several of them trained their bows on Tink and drew back to shoot. Put down your weapons, Artham commanded. He's no fang! He flew across the deck and at the last moment knocked one of the bows upwards so that the arrow whizzed harmlessly into the air. But as soon as Artham turned his back, Tink leapt overboard into the icy sea. That was the moment Janner truly became a throne warden. Without a thought, Janner tore off his coat and ran. His heart's deepest instinct drove him forward and over the ship's rail to save his brother. As soon as he hit the water, the world became a frigid, airless black. 
Too cold to think, he grabbed a handful of fur and pulled it near. Claws raked his skin. He felt, teeth, he felt Tink's teeth again and again, but he held his brother close. When every desperate gasp filled his lungs with water, he hugged the fang to himself with all his strength. The sea turned red with Janner's blood. The last thing he knew was Artham's strong, taloned hands. He felt himself lifted on mighty wings from blackness to light, from silence to sound. And though his wounds were deep and bled freely, though Tink still fought to escape his embrace, and Janner's heart burned great joy. The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson Book 2 North or Be Eaten Chapter 65 The Final Voyage of Poto Helmer And so Poto Helmer sailed the dark sea of darkness for the last time. The wing feathers traveled east to the green hollows, where many years before a rowdy pirate was tamed by the tender love of a woman named Wendelin Igby. Poto had often seen on the deck of the ship late at night while most of the crew slept. He gazed at the starbright heavens and breathed deep the salty air, for he knew the night held a special beauty when one was far from land. He carried his leg bone whenever he went and it brought him great pleasure to bang it on the mast to signal mealtimes. He moved through the days in peace and wonder, for his whole story had been told for the first time, and he found that he was still loved. For days, Oscar and Retief was desperately seasick. His face was pale, and every few minutes he staggered like a drunkard to the ship's rail and provided the fish with rather unpleasant food. But soon the old man's pate became tanned and leathery, he learned the ropes with gusto and soon became as much a sailor as any of the crew. The Chimerans convinced him to shave his head, and in a fit of recklessness, he even allowed them to tattoo his arm with the somewhat unimpressive inscription, I like books. Though he ate little and worked hard, at the end of the voyage, he was as round and squishy as ever. Nyan and Lili tended to the brothers. When Janner woke, he ached from head to toe. He knew his wounds were severe because of the look on his mother's face when she changed his bandages. He lay in bed for days and listened to the creak of the ship and the thump of footsteps overhead. All his life he had dreamed of sailing, and now that he was finally on the open sea, he was confined to a bed. But he had plenty of time to reflect on his journey from Glipwood to Dugtown, to the ice prairies, to the bed where he now lay. And in the end, he was grateful. He also had plenty of time to talk to Tink. The wolf lay on the bed next to Janner, strapped down with leather cords. He refused to eat soup or even cooked fish, but devoured hunks of raw meat that Nye and Lily tossed into his mouth. He snapped at anyone who came near, and whenever they tried to talk to him, he howled and snarled. At first, Nye attended to him with grief playing on her face. But soon a change came over her, and she kept her back straight and her chin high. She spoke to him firmly and told him, I love you, Kalmar whether or not he growled at her. And every day when she arrived and before she left, she looked him in the eye and asked him his name. His answer was always violent. I don't know, he would say, or I have no name. His howls rattled the windows. But at night, when moonlight passed through the small round window and slid across the floor, Janner whispered stories to Kalmar, and Kalmar listened. You were fast, Janner said. You could outrun me backward if you wanted to. In the summer, when the days were long, we would run up the hill to the Blaggett's boy's house and play Zibsby until it got too dark to see. What's Zibsby? Tink whispered, and Janner told him. Once you hit a thwop in Grandpa's underwear drawer, Janner said with a hiss of pain because it hurt to laugh. Then what happened? asked the wolf. Grandpa jumped so high his head put a hole in the ceiling. He weren't allowed to play Zibsby for a week, but we could tell Grandpa thought it was funny. In the morning, when Naya and Lily arrived with breakfast, Naya would ask the Grey Fang his name, and, teeth, and Tink would be all teeth and howls again. His eyes stayed that awful, empty yellow. Janner began to ache for the nightmare, so, nighttime so that he wouldn't have to see those wolf eyes watching him. 
At night, he could stare at the moon and tell his brother stories and pretend for a little while that the animal was gone. More than once, Arthur strode into the cabin and spoke to Tink, but whenever he appeared, the wolf was ferocious. Your name is Kalmar, Arthur would say with impatience, and Kalmar would howl with pain. Soon, Arthur stopped coming at all. Then one night, something changed. Janner told his brother of the fork factory and his escape through the streets of Dugtown. He told of his decision to rescue Tink from Claxton Weaver's cage and of the despair he felt when he was too late. There was no moon that night, so all Janner could see of his brother was an outline by the little window. The wolf spoke, stopping Janner in mid-sentence. I remember, Tink whispered. Janner didn't know what to say. So we lay in the dark for a long time, hardly daring to breathe. The seas were calm, so the waves made little sound against the hull. Then Janner heard, so soft that he thought it might be his imagination, the gray fang crying in the dark. Janner fell asleep with hope in his heart. In the morning, when Naya and Lily entered the room, Janner lay still, afraid to open his eyes and find that Tink's tears had been but a dream the little gray fang as wild and vicious as ever. Janner begged the maker to answer his prayers. And the maker did. Good morning, Janner, Naya said. She sat on his bed and kissed his forehead. Your grandfather spotted land this morning. He said we're only two days from the green hollows. And good morning to you, she said to Kalmar. The furry creature stirred. What's your name? My name, the creature said, with its eyes still shut, is Kalmar. My father was Esben Wingfeather, and I am his son, the High King of Anaria. If an artist were asked to paint a picture of perfect joy and wonder, it would look exactly like Naya's face in that moment. She wept. Lily covered her mouth with both hands and squealed. Janner leapt out of bed and ran to his brother's side in spite of the pain that shot through his body. Tink, he said. Kalmar opened his eyes, and they were clear and blue. Thus ends Book Two of the Wingfeather Saga by Andrew Peterson. North or be eaten. Appendices to Book Two by of the Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. North or be eaten. A passage from the first book, as translated in Chimera by Oscar N. Retief and Naya Igby Wingfeather. It came to pass that Jurgen's son, heir of the Dragon King, lay dying by Omer's hand. Jurgen's son believed that Omer of Anyara, son of Duane, met harm on the dragons and battled him on the shore of the great southern mountains. Omar bested the dragon, but killed him not, and raced up the mountain to the hall of Jurgen, the dragon king, for indeed he did not wish for the young dragon to die. Omar feared for his life and did not tell Jurgen that it was he himself who wounded the son of the dragon king. He told Jurgen of the secret of the healing stones at the heart of the world, stones that warmed the days and opened the eyes, stones that the Maker lit with life when the world was made. A flinder of Halori might save the young dragon, Omer told him, and so Jurgen and his dragons burrowed. They clawed through layers of granite and marble, limestone and grink, through rivers colder than ice, through stone so hot it bubbled, until at last, because their roots were hollowed and weak, the mountains fell. The rocks shook and land broke from land. Many waters lifted the deep places, filled the deep places, and cities moved like ships unmoored. Great waves swept across the continents and buried peoples and all their histories. Songs were silenced forever. Aware of the destruction above, Jurgen dug deeper, at last into a cavern with a ceiling so tall that clouds rained and lightning flashed. Yea, even in the cavern, jewels glittered in stone like stars in space. The walls shone with patterns of severe beauty, fanciful whirls and bold lines. 
loveliness that told of mysteries ancient and fine. And Jurgen knew that the makers strode the deep places where the wells of the world began, and the hollow re and hollow wells spread underfoot like, like street cobbles. There the maker planted the power that blossoms the tree and rolls the tide. There he laughed into life the song that gathers the clouds to water the soil into seed and cover with snow the mountain crowns. There lay the magic that beat the heart of ere we are, and it shall not be diminished until the last day, for so the maker said, and so shall it be done. In sight of his dragons, Jurgen the dragon king sank his teeth into the bright stone and dislodged two pebbles, tiny sparkles of sun. He sped upward to save his wounded heir, but behold, Jurgen found him dead, and his mountain kingdom was crumbled. Jurgen folded his wings in sorrow at his folly, and the dragons diminished. There was a great wailing in ere we are, for many bodies lay cold on the ocean floor. Even the behemoths, dwellers of the deep, filled the dark sea with sorrowful music, for they hovered wide over the ocean floor and knew evil in the death of so many. So ended the first epoch. That is the story as it has always been told, but that is not the truth. Nay, treachery brought this evil on the world, and the treacher's name was Will, second son of Duane, brother of Omer. It was Ouster Will who sought the power of the hollow re and the hollow well, and he knew his father Duane would never show him the way to the deep places where he walked in fellowship with the Maker. So Ouster Will disguised himself as Omer. When Omer was away, Will stole his brother's armor and carried his sword. He sailed to the southern mountains and sank Omer's blade into the young dragon, Jurgen's heir. Auster Will sped off to the hall of the dragon king and, pretending to be Omer, tricked Jurgen. He told Jurgen of the healing stones, for he planned to follow the dragon king into the core of the world and learn many secrets. But Auster Will foresaw not that the mountains would crumble and the world way would be forever sealed. It was Ouster Will who wasted the world, and Ouster Will who spread the lie that it was Omar's doing. The Maker knows this, and shall mete out vengeance. This is my prayer, for J, even, for I, even I, am Omer, son of Duane, and I walk the world alone. It is my hand that writes this, and no others. A traditional Hollish children's rhyme about the infamous Will, son of Duane, from Fencher's Scary Tales and Spooks. Ouster Will. Ouster Will, Ouster Will. He breathes on your ankles beneath your bed, waits till you're sleeping and sneaks in your head, darkens your dreams so you wish you were dead, under the ground on the graveyard hill. Ouster Will, Ouster Will. He tickles your neck like a spider's twine. Smells like the sweat of a snorting swine, shivers your bones and rattles your spine, grins in the dark on the window sill. It's Ouster Will, Ouster Will, open the shutters and brighten the lamp, let in the light and wake up the camp. Your heart is a panic, your forehead is damp, he's there in the corner to frighten and kill. You open the shade, the dark is distilled, your eyes roam the room for the wickedly smile from the form of the fiend in the laundry pile. For the shadowy shape of the villain so vile, your voice is shrill, O oh, Ouster Will! But it's only a chill, not Ouster Will, tis the shade of the tree on the bedroom wall, and the creak of the boards in the basement hall, and the scritch of a mouse on the floor, that's all, not Ouster Will, peace be still. Thus end the appendices to Book Two, North or Be Eaten of the Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Join us next time for book three in the Wing Feather Saga, The Monster in the Hollows by Andrew Peterson. <laughs>